Well, it's your fault, actually. You know, I oh. told you, I think, a, a week or so ago when we talked about this. That Okay, so let me give you some background okay. here. So I want to know how it's my fault. I will. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. A lot of things are your fault, as it turns out. Oh, so, no. Yeah, yeah. So the, the College of Psychologists has basically levied what are equivalent to about 13 lawsuits against me simultaneously. Now, the reason I call them lawsuits is because there are actions undertaken on behalf of a complainant. Now, the complainant can be anyone anywhere in the world who complains about me for any reason. They don't have to be former clients. They don't even have to be anybody I've ever met. They don't even have to have met anybody I've ever met. So, you know... So it could be someone online. Well, it is. All this is pretty much... All these complaints are someone online. None of them are my clients, although half of them claim to be falsely. And the college didn't throw out their complaints despite that. So, which is really quite interesting. And what are the complaints? Well... Okay, let, let's see. Uh, the, one complaint is about the tweet I made about Ellen or Elliot Page, and when I said that a criminal physician cut off her breasts and that pride was the sin, so now I'm in trouble again because I just said the same thing. One was about uh, Sports Illustrated cover where that yeah. featured that overweight model, and I tweeted out, not beautiful, and um, I guess that was something like fat shaming. I don't remember exactly what the, what the, what the charge was. And then I criticized Justin Trudeau and a former staff member of Justin Trudeau and Jacinda Ardern. I made a joke about her coming. I was going to New Zealand and the New Zealand leftist press was freaking out. And I made this joke about bringing my alt-right trolls to New Zealand. And, and then I put in parentheses, or maybe they're just, you know, ordinary people who are trying to clean up their rooms. So apparently that was casting the profession into disgrace. And then they submitted one complainant from the U.S., submitted the entire transcript of our last discussion. So, you know, I don't know how to defend myself against that because apparently everything I say and apparently everything you say too is bringing the profession of psychology into disgrace. And I think they're most upset in that case about uh, my comments about the inadequacy of climate models. And so, you know, what that has to do with my clinical practice is questionable to say the least. And so, anyways... Does that cover it? Yeah, it yeah. seems like this climate thing is a very rigid ideology that one must subscribe to wholesale. Yeah. You, you can't have any nuanced opinions on it, and you can't yeah. have any there's oh, it's no, a religion. No variation. It's a religion. Yeah. It's a, actually, it's a, it's a pseudo, it's a partial pseudo religion. And, and I, I mean that technically. I'm going to write about this to some degree in I'm writing a new book, which will come out in November, called We Who Wrestle With God, and I'll cover that in this. But Alex Epstein, who wrote Fossil Fuel Future recently, comments about this a bit. So the basic structure of the quasi-religious belief, and so this is the set of initial presumptions. That's a way of thinking about it. You know, we were talking about how ideas are structured earlier. The Marxists believe that everything's about power. There's a narrative at the base of any belief system, and the climate... Uh, the climate pseudo-religion is based on characterization of nature as something like a hapless, uh, what would you call, hapless, defenseless, fragile virgin. The, uh, the industrial activity of mankind is, is characterized as something like a rapacious, uh, power-mad, uh, re- yeah, 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 uh, demolisher of natural virginity and beauty. And then the human being is, the individual, is characterized as nothing but a, you know, a devouring mouth whose activity runs contrary to the, to the untrammeled beauty of the planet and that supports the activity of the tyrannical patriarchy. That's basically it. And so the reason that narrative has force is because it draws on underlying religious archetypes. And so... To characterize the world properly, you do need to characterize the positive aspect of nature because you have to live in something approximating a reciprocal harmony with nature. Because if you just eat everything and, you know, devour everything in your local landscape, well, then you die. So that's a bad idea. So you have to have some sense of the value of nature. Now, you also have some have to have some sense of the fact that if you were dropped in the jungle naked in the Amazon, you'd be dead in about 48 hours. So you also need a figure to characterize the negative element of nature, and that's completely absent from the environmental myth. That's part of what makes it pathological. And then with regard to the rapacious tyranny, let's say, well, you know, any industrial system 
or any human organization can exploit the natural world to the point where that's not sustainable and it can become oppressive and tyrannical. That's the evil king, ancient part of religious mythology going back as far back as we can chase it. So you need a representation of the negative aspect of society because you know, you go to you send your kids to school and they kind of get turned into these cookie cutter kids and that crushes their innate, uh, what would you say, difference and beauty and it's all the pain of having to be socialized and you have to understand that there is this oppressive element of culture. And so, but then, you know, you should also wake up and, and notice that you've got the wise king too and that means you put, you plug in your damn toaster in the morning and the electricity works and you go out on the street and everyone isn't rioting and you know there's workmen who are knee deep knee deep in the sludge trying to keep everything going and you're not starving to death like everybody on the planet was in 1860 and so a little gratitude for the positive end of the patriarchy is in order too and that's completely absent in the environmental view and then with regard to the individual it's like well of course you can be a selfish impulsive hedonistic consumer and you can facilitate the rapacious tyranny as a consequence of that rape the planet. But by the same token, you know, we're not a cancer on the face of the earth. We're not a virus that's mutating and taking out the planet, you know, and we're not trapped in a Malthusian nightmare. And you got to give credit where it's due. And, you know, there's an element of people, of everyone that's noble and, and generous and kind and productive and capable of living in a well-ordered state in something like sustainable and productive harmony with nature. You only get half that story. Now, if you have no comprehensive underlying cultural narrative, which is increasingly the case in our society, and someone offers you when you're a teenager half the religious story, that'll just snap you up in a second because it helps you order your relationship with mm. the world. It gives you a pathway too, eh? So Jean Piaget, the great developmental psychologist, he called the last stage of adolescence, the messianic period, the messianic stage. Now, most people don't talk much about that, I think, because they're, they don't know what to make of Piaget's claim, but he was a real genius, Jean Piaget.